way loud, I'm sorry. I am excited as well. Um, so Brittany didn't mention it, so I'm gonna take it on me to mention it, um, that you might notice my shirt. This is actually literal today. You have a full lineup of awesome female tech speakers. So I just wanna take a second to have a round of applause for that, because it was an accident. They didn't plan it, it didn't happen on purpose. It was an accident and that makes me so happy. So today I'm gonna to be telling you the truth about mobile first indexing. And mobile first indexing is something that Google announced in 2016. And so it should be launching in 2018, probably. We hope so. It's been delayed a couple times, and we've heard mixed messages from Googlers about what's going on. We heard from Gary uh, that it's launching in 2018, uh, but two weeks ago we heard from John Mueller that some sites that are ready are already getting introduced or added to the mobile first index, but they didn't specify which sites or how or where or when or anything like that. So. Launching soon, you need to be ready for it, even if we don't know exactly when it's gonna launch. It was pre-announced, that means it's a big deal. So, since it was pre-announced and we've had a while to talk about it, a lot of SEOs have been speculating uh, what it's gonna be about. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing in those speculations is a lot about mobile friendliness, and that's confusing to me because that already happened. Mobile friendliness was like last year, the year before a little bit. Mobile friendly, friendliness is great, but it's not mobile first indexing. If, if they tell you that that's what it's about, that's fake news, that's not true. This is nicer fake news than you see elsewhere with the pug. That's not my dog yet though, someone else's dog. So. Mobile first design and mobile first indexing are two different concepts and I don't want you to get them confused or you'll miss a really, really important part of what you can expect in this update. So there are three words in this name of the update, mobile first indexing. So I suggest we do like Rand and break it down. Is Rand here? Do the Rand dance. All right, what is mobile? Mobile means a lot of different things, and if you listen to Google, mobile means just about anything that's not a desktop or laptop computer. People are saying mobile to mean anything like even fridges, which are definitely not portable, right? They're, they're kind of taking the word out of its original context, but I want you to believe, or I want you to at least consider, that the mobile first indexing update might not be using the word mobile in the way that you're expecting. I think mobile first indexing is using the word mobile to describe the content rather than the device it's gonna be presented on. Google wants your content to be portable. Let's replace it with portable, okay? So portable instead of mobile. First, what does that mean? It's a sequence or a prioritization. It's not an exclusionary thing. It's not to say that desktop content won't be there or won't have a place, right? That still exists, that's still important. Google made a lot of money there. Indexing, this is really important. What is an index? Index is a word that's existed long before search engines uh, came around to try and organize all the information in the world. Indexes are just ways of organizing big sets of similar kind of data so that it can be easily queried to find something. For instance, a Yellow Pages is an index of businesses in alphabetical order by name. A White Pages is an index of businesses in alphabetical order by the type of business they are. Uh, at the library, the Dewey Decimal System is an index of books that they have available in their library, and only in their library, right? And no one knows how to use that index anymore. But I 
want you to understand that indexing and ranking are two different things. And when we talk about indexing in this context, there are three parts, three things historically that a search engine does, right? We know this. Crawling, indexing, and ranking. Indexing is the middle piece. If you're not in the index, you're never going to rank. You can't get there. The index is the list of possible correct answers for a query. So that's important. And it's also an indication that this may be a structural change to how Google works. It's not turning up the dial or turning down the dial on a certain ranking factor. It's how it's organized. That's structural. That's cool. That's different. We, don't see, we haven't seen that since caffeine, really, if you're old enough to remember caffeine. Is anyone old enough to remember caffeine? Woo, yeah. Great. Okay. So let's put it all together. Portable, prioritized ordering of information for easy query. Mobile first indexing. Portable, prioritized organization of information for easy query. Awesome. This could fundamentally change your understanding of what people or what Google really means when they say mobile first indexing. So I want you to take that, and now I want you to think about it with this model in mind. Um, you may have seen me talk before, or Emily, my colleague, this is the, the S curve of technology, the technology S curve. And what it describes is the normal pattern that new technologies go through as they get adopted. So we start with this slow new innovation, and then it starts to catch on. There are some improvements. It's looking better. It's working better. And then once everyone has one, or it's old news, it kind of flattens back out again. So it makes this S shape. And this is what most of us, the average person out there, participates right along this line. But the average isn't the only. And there's always other stuff happening. So we have smaller component improvements that make up the larger system improvement um, that enable the adoption and encourage the adoption and the growth. But we have incumbent technology, too. And in the background, new adopters, earlier innovative adopters, are checking out new stuff in the background so that um, Sometimes it feels like technology sneaks up on us, and we're like, whoa, all of a sudden, I had all these CDs, and now everyone's using MP3s. I had all these DVDs, and now they're useless because everyone's in the cloud. Um, I have a media server. All of a sudden, you're like, wait, I spent all this money on all that crap, and what do I do with it now? And it's because in the background, that kind of innovation was happening. And so this is a diagram or a timeline of Google's innovation and some of the things that were like component improvements or seemed like they were component improvements in regular search that we deal with day to day, but were actually probably more likely part of this new technology improvement. So the beginning of voice search and then the addition of semantic understanding to voice search with Hummingbird and then rank brain. I didn't make this graph, but someone else is on the same page as me because they see these things as a larger story that go together. Because Hummingbird is using semantic understanding with AI, with machine learning, to make voice search uh, a continuous loop of feeding back query and response, query and response, so that the machine uh, learning can learn more and adapt and give you the closer, more correct answer as you go to drill down. So what you also have to understand is that the voice-first device footprint has grown exponentially. This is on, like it's right now going into that steep curve. Because all of a sudden in 2017, we have loads of devices that don't have what? Screens. They don't have screens, and if they don't have screens, they probably don't have browsers or keyboards. So people are interacting with technology that's on the internet with only their voice. And this is taking off. Here's something you probably don't know. Chatbots, moment for moment, are actually growing faster than apps ever did. Native apps grew really fast, right? Who doesn't use at least one native app every day? Probably three or four. Probably Facebook, Slack, 
Uber, you forget they're even native apps, right? Because they're so fundamental to your life. Those grew fast, but chatbots are growing faster if you line it up at the same start point. Chatbots are fundamental and important for mobile-first indexing because they get into the AI feedback loop. And Perna did a great job of talking about how important chatbots are going to be. Um, and it's not just with Bing, right? Chatbots sound, to me, originally, they sounded hokey and dumb. Um, but when you understand exactly how they work, um, you get the, the feeling of how powerful they're going to be for our industry. Now, the other thing that kind of happened that no one really thought was that cool except for me was Chromecast. Chromecast is a game changer, too, because it allows things that don't have screens send information to things that do. So again, we're enabling the voice-first, no-screen, internet-connected devices to have a screen if they should need one whenever they want, but not have to carry it around all the time. And it's making our phones more of like a, a portable information system, and then the big screens are just dummy docks that you can send information from a lot of different devices. And that's super cool. That's disruptive, and Google knows it, right? Because right now, you can search for things and within two clicks be casting it. Um, so this one, you search for a video, you click on it, it takes you to YouTube, and you're clicking to cast it. There is no reason at all that that cast button couldn't appear next to the, epi the season episode number directly in the search result, and I think it will soon, right? So casting, in this case, is taking a search query or a search landing, SEO traffic, almost away, right? You're just playing the video, but you're not landing on an actual web page to do it. You're doing it, in this case, from YouTube, in the future, potentially, directly from the search result page. And right now, you can't send directly from the search result page unless you're cooking cupcakes, and then you can. Send to my Google Home. So it's not casting it to a TV, it's casting a recipe directly from a search result to my Google Home, so that my Google Home will tell me the recipe as I cook so that I don't have to use grubby fingers on a device. That's pretty awesome. That's a game changer. That makes life easier to do. And the other thing to know is you can see how important Google thinks this technology is because they're building it directly into their phone operating systems at the basic level, so that these technologies can be set up when you're setting up your new phone and you never have to think about it again. And the phone becomes the nexus of all your information, and you can cast things from one device to another without even thinking about it. And it's not just Chromecast, Google, Google Home as well, throughout your, your whole house, right? This is the beginning of the connected home. Here's the problem. If you've been dealing with Google in your life, uh, for long enough, you know that they're kind of quirky, and they don't always talk to one another within the different teams. And so they get confused about launch dates for things like mobile-first indexing, but they also get confused about who's the lead technology, who's the lead group on a particular um, innovation. And so I say who's on first here, because every team at Google seems to be claiming this new incumbent, or this new uh, innovative technology that we're talking about with mobile first indexing. So there's the mobile team, the cr mobile Chrome, they're saying it's mobile first. But if you paid any attention to Google I.O. this year, their annual conference, huge talk about offline first. This is especially important for the next billion users. AI first, learning, rank brain, learning algorithms, stuff like that, artificial intelligence. Google Now team cares about that. And then voice, for, voice search. So the, the connected devices care about that. Here's the thing. They're all, if you read documentation, they're all like, it's a mobile first world. It's an AI first world. It's all of these things. We just don't have a name for it yet. They're all pushing you to put all of your information up in the cloud as a company and as an individual so that they can access it and represent it in a great way on a bunch of different devices, regardless of whether or not there's a screen. 
So how are they doing that? The main thing is they're trying to leverage the power of big data and semantics to make the web a better place, right? And so if you put all of your content in a really clean, easy, accessible format in the cloud, then it can be sent to all these different places and it can be updated fr from a server and then correct on all different devices without much effort, right? If, that's, if the canonical lives in the cloud and not on a device or not within a specific presentation scenario, then you have the same data on all devices. You're logged in, you've got a shopping cart that follows you along on any, any device, that's fantastic. But it's also, for the user, a really great predictable experience where there's less room for problems, right? It's predictability. And whether you admit it or not, we're human. We like predictability. We like to know what experience we're going to get when we go get something. It's like Starbucks or anything like that. It may not be the best, but you know what you're going to get. And that's what Google's going for here, because we're all human. So achieve, to achieve this in the most efficient way, we have to change the way we do things. And so we have to really start thinking about separating our content from our design further. So CSS helped people, help webmasters, separate content from design. But then webmasters got really interested in creating uh, design for specific devices. And then we kind of went towards responsive. But the, the content and the design and the presentation layer were completely enmeshed. Um, so that it made crawling for Google even harder. Um, and finding the content, isolating the content, and deduping the content from all of its different device iterations became really hard. And so we have to let marketers do the marketing, let content creators do the content creation, and let uh, the developers just program, just touch the code, and not have to rely on each other so much to create the, the experience that we want. And if you look about, at what Google's been focusing on recently, um, what they've been pushing to us, they all are instances of separate content from design or very cleanly extractable content from design. AMP, PWAs, APIs, uh, data sets, all of these things we'll talk about in more detail. But those are things that, that really, really separate the content from the presentation layer and the design. And this is important because Google believes that its job is to crawl and in or to index the world's information. But crawling has lost its appeal because so much information is being created every day. And Google didn't just say they wanted to index the world's web pages. They said they wanted to index and rank and show the world's information. And there's a lot of information out there that they can't capture because it's just being created so quickly on the fly every day. 90% of the world's information was created in the past two years, and the rate of information creation is growing exponentially as we all get more and more connected devices. My Fitbit knows what I did today, and it's got its set of information. Um, my Nest knows what temperature to, to set it to next week. All of these things have their own uh, information that they're generating, and Google wants to help us with that too. Um, so crawling has become inefficient. There are more efficient ways for a search engine to get information. Uh, when, when they crawl, they have to crawl through years and years of legacy code and things that have been commented out and stuff that you just left in there because it kind of works sometimes on some devices. That's not efficient, um, and it's getting worse as there's more stuff that they're supposed to crawl. So, the most efficient ways Google can access your content are things that we're not talking about in this industry too much yet. Um, they can get it directly from hosting it. They can get it from you guys sending feeds, like XML feeds, to them. They can lift it out of JSON-LD files. Um, they can get it through engaging with your plugins or your progressive web apps. 
and they can get it through APIs. And in those scenarios, the content is easier to extract than to try and pull it out of HTML. Um, so the idea here is I think to some degree you can expect the bots, the crawlers, to be out of a job at some point in the future, or at least a different job, a pivot, because they might be there to verify things, but discovery uh, just isn't scalable anymore. And so this is why it's all so important, is we put the voice search with stuff like rank brain and artificial intelligence, and we can have a, a conversation to get the most recent information um, without having to do another crawl, without having a bot to have to visit your site. If you're sending a feed or if you're hosting the content with Google, they can know instantly when it's updated. They don't, you're not on any kind of a crawl delay. And this is replacement technology. This is important. I can't say it enough. So here's my speculation. And I've been saying this for about six months, but I've been saying it a little bit differently. I think mobile-first indexing is really about cloud-first indexing. No URL required. If you're an SEO, that might have just really hurt or broken your brain, caused a little angst, right? As SEOs, we've always said a URL for every piece of unique content, one-to-one, -one, right? Now we're saying, maybe not. Who cares about URLs? They're ugly. We have to migrate them all the time. Accident prone, as we heard from Dick's Sporting Goods. URLs cause problems, actually. They have parameters. Why, why URLs? We have this pile of new devices coming out from Google and everyone else that doesn't include a screen. And without a screen, it doesn't have a browser. So without a browser, who cares about URLs? Who cares? We have devices with teeny tiny screens that Google created, but they don't really have browsers, right? So there are more and more things out there in the wild that are showing up and getting linked together and presented kind of quietly by Google in the search results. Um, without URLs. And Google's actively trying to link those things together even if they don't have URLs. So we can cast things, we can send things to cardboard, but we can also send things that don't have URLs to other people as a text message. Does everyone see on the right side of the, the slide the triangle shape? That's a share icon. What it means is that Google has created a dynamic link for this content, that this content doesn't, this knowledge graph of Florence and the Machine doesn't have a URL, it's just knowledge graph. It just shows up in a SERP. But if you want to share that knowledge graph result, here's, here's a Google-generated URL that will work for you to share it. So they're generating, like Bitly style, shortener URLs to share content if you need to, if you don't, no, no problem. Just consume it in the search result. But during these interactions, when you're in a knowledge graph, let, so here's my example, I search for drumming song, it gives me information, it gives me a video of that song, but then I can click around and see all the other songs that Florence and the Machine has come out with. And so on the right is the, the songs, and I can click on any of those and play the video or listen to the song. Notice it didn't update the query. It's just letting me drill down. It's giving me a new experience without new URLs, without new queries. It's trying to understand in an AI kind of way, when I search for this, what am I going to want next? Other songs. That makes sense. So let's look at other examples of this. If you've tried a, a search in Google Now for a restaurant, you get this Yelp-like experience, explore my area. It's hooked into the GPS. Um, you can, it's trying to replace Yelp. That's kind of cool. All of those things, no URL. The videos that show up in SERPs, they may have a URL in 
uh, YouTube, uh, but you don't have to have the URL to play the video. TV shows, this is again in Google Now. Um, you can go through a list of related TV shows, tell them which one you like. This page I cannot share with you because it doesn't have a URL. It's all coming from the knowledge graph. Uh, books, again, the shareable link, I can, I can link you with a dynamic link, but all of that content just is hosted by Google, lives in their cloud, doesn't have its own URL, at least that they're trying to send you to. It's not a, not a crawled SERP, it's a submitted SERP, just lives in Google. And sounds, so we have a fun demo here. I'm gonna ask everyone to pull out their phone and do a search for a cow sound. If you've seen me talk, we may have done this before, but it's fun. I'll do it too. And turn up your volume if you have your phone on mute. Now click the cow sound. Who knew that you could do that? Right? What's interesting about that is you can search for it from your desktop or your phone, and it works. This is a thing that shows up in a search result that you can interact with that has no URL. There's no website with a button where you can click it. It's just in the SERP, okay? It's got this visual representation, but actually it doesn't have to because that query works with Google Assistant or Google Home too. There are some queries, voice-oriented queries, that work with Google Assistant and Google Home that don't even have the visual aspect. So we're gonna do a live demo um, and hope that the demo gods are with me. Play a C sharp. Here's a C sharp. So that's the canonical answer. That's what a cow sounds like. That's the only thing that a cow sounds like, and that's the only thing that a C-sharp sounds like. Google doesn't give you options. You don't get to choose which C-sharp they play, what instrument or whatever. That's it. We can also do um, translation. Say car in French. Voiture. Okay, so that's cool. But again, if you're an SEO, it's terrifying because you don't get any credit for second place. And Google's not telling us how to be in first place, but I'm gonna talk about it. So again, incumbent or replacement technology, this is new stuff, it's a whole new game. So, to understand how those things work, you have to understand feeds in XML and why they're important. Feeds in XML that people feed directly to Google almost always rank in position zero. They're at the top. If you search for like a movie time, Google's not crawling these movie theaters every day to get their updated movie schedule. It's coming in as a feed. Shopping feeds, they're getting updated, availability, pricing all the time. Sports scores, that's updated in a feed constantly. Google couldn't crawl this fast. Weather, that's a feed. Exchange rates, that's a feed. Now these ones, for the most part, are not Google-owned properties. They're properties that are working with Google to get them the information that they know that people need. So if you are lucky enough to say, hey Google, we have a feed and you're not really helping customers or searchers that much by showing regular results, maybe you should show a feed, then you could be the first one, like weather.com, to have the feed that Google features. And the feeds, remember, XML feeds or, or other kinds of feeds, are just information that Google throws into a presentation layer. Right? It's easy. Easy, easy, easy. So if you're in an industry where these things aren't happening, what I would advise you to do is to figure out how you can put your information, especially if it's updating on a regular basis, into a feed, and then try and send it to Google. Then try and work with Google, find someone, make sure that everyone knows that your feed exists. And then you get position zero, without SEO, really. That's not SEO, is it? Or maybe it is. Hosting in Firebase, who was here last year? Woo! 
Okay, last year I talked about Firebase, and I still love the title of my presentation. It was called Indexing on Fire. It was so cool. And what Firebase is, is a Google product that's all about hosting. They host your apps and they give this service to you so that you get better measurement, but more ability to do cool things like do live updates to your apps without people having to do another download, um, stuff like that. So Firebase is really, really cool, but it's basically just hosting. And hosting is actually wonderful for Google if they can get you to host your content with them, what don't they have to do? Crawl it. They just have it. So they can know it, they can crawl it at their own pace, they can know when you change it, because they see it in the hosting records, then they recrawl it right away when you change it, and they don't have to crawl randomly hoping that they'll find something new. What else do they get? Engagement data. They know what the most popular stuff on, on your stuff is, because they can see what's getting the engagement. So they know what people like, and when they like it. Hosting is powerful, and the balance between the cost of hosting versus the cost of crawling has switched. The cost of crawling has gone way up because there's so much stuff to crawl, it's not efficient anymore, but the cost of hosting has gone way down. We have Moore's Law getting us more and more storage ability for cheaper and cheaper. And there are lots of instances where we're seeing Google hosting having a great impact, like AMP. What happens in AMP? You give all your content over to Google to host it. It's in Google's cloud. Also, just FYI on that first one, below the AMP stuff is the news, separate index, or not a separate index, but kind of a feed. And then the, below it is the Twitter feed, the fire hose. That's a feed, too. Notice all this stuff at the top? Fancy. Answers. Answers are from a crawl, but Google lifts the answers and hosts it themselves. Same thing with image thumbnails and video thumbnails. Anything that they see is valuable enough, they'll lift it and host it themselves because they know their server is faster than yours, and they can show it really fast if they host it. They can have a really rich, nice experience at the top of the page without relying on anyone else's servers. They can vet it, stuff like that. If your page goes down, they're hosting it, so it doesn't matter. They still have a good experience. Hosting is powerful. Um, conversions, things like that, uh, they just host all this information. This is different, this utility is different from the um, conversion ratios because it's just a, it doesn't change the conversion. Uh, the currency conversion changes all the time, but cups to pints doesn't, so they just host that and do the math up at the top. Events, they aggregate these and host the information. Um, we talked about uh, the thumbnails and YouTube. Of course, they host the YouTube content, too. Um, new traffic information. Now they're putting the traffic information as its own unique thing that you can open a new window. That's cool. So with Firebase, Firebase handles the hosting, and they're encouraging people to integrate with Firebase. Um, because it has a lot of benefits for webmasters, but also because it involves you hosting your content with them, and they see value there. Uh, but Firebase is pivoting the message. It was just about apps, but they're also including PWAs, but not including websites. Why? Websites are harder. Also, who remembers um, instant apps? Instant apps live in the cloud, but they're native apps that you can access on your phone through the browser. And they're indexable on dynamic deep links. So apps are hard to link because they don't have URLs, but in Firebase, you can overlay URLs on anything by creating a dynamic deep link. OK. Other things, JSON and JSON-LD. So JSON, this might be too technical, but stay with me. It's really simple. JSON is basically a flat database file. Let's just think of it, like get rid of the rest of it, just think of it briefly like that. And JSON-LD is a flat database file with schema, pretend. Like, that's the simplified understanding. 
And Google is pushing people towards JSON-LD all over the place. We've seen this shift where they want schema in JSON-LD in the head of your HTML. We have clients that Google is working with directly saying, hey, maybe you know, for this kind of content, let's move that schema into a separate file. Why? They don't even have to crawl the web page then if it's in a separate file. They just go get that. Application association files that tell Google this is the web version and this is the app version and they are the same, JSON, essentially. Uh, PWA service workers generate JSON files that live on your phone. And data sets. You can mark up data sets with schema now. This was a sneaky thing that they added during Google I.O. They updated all their schema.org data and, and guides and they added how do you mark up a database with schema? Snuck it in. This is new. This is ranking. This is how it's going to happen in the future. So PWAs. PWAs, I mentioned, as part of Firebase. Stands for Progressive Web Apps. This was a big deal in my talk last year. But if you weren't here, who now knows what a PWA is? Oh, come on. So PWAs are like, kind of like plugins, like browser plugin, but they open their own browser window and restyle it. So they lean really hard on the code of the, the browser, but then restyle it and add their own content. And that makes them really fast and really light, and it means that you don't have to download a new app to make your app experience work because you're leaning on the code of the browser, the, the browser code, the browser app. It's like a spin-off of your browser. Fast, they convert really well, users love them. Those PWAs use service workers to manage caching on your phone. So caching is where you save all the information that you've accessed before. And the service worker allows this app to re-access any text or images that you've accessed before because it's cached locally. So it works offline for anything that you've done before. And people are creatures of habit. They look at the same thing over and over again. That's not a problem for everything that you do on your phone for it to work offline. But for some things, it really is. So the service worker does that. The service worker actually creates a file that is literally called index.db and it's basically an API for Google's crawler. I asked Googlers, someone who wasn't media trained, how does Google crawl the service worker? And he said, we don't. We crawl the API. It creates. That's how. It's a database, just the content, not the design stuff, not the HTML, just the text and the images, or videos, whatever. And then the PWA has an app shell that's a separate file and works to help do that. Google has added the availability to see what's caching in a service worker to Chrome Dev Tools so that people can go in there and see how is offline first going to work here. The reason we know that they like this and that they care about it and that it's going to continue to be a thing is that Google is turning a bunch of the content that they've been using in Google Now, on Android anyway, into PWAs. Who's seen this? You guys are asleep. Wake up. OK, so this one, you're in the, the thing that I was saying, the restaurant search that's going to replace Yelp. Can I add it to my home screen? Yes, I can. Now I have the Google restaurant um, PWA added to my home screen. And I can open it from my home screen. That's web content that looks like an app on my phone, and it's Google. It's happening in a lot of different things. We have food, we have sports, we have traffic. It works for Google Translate. They are spinning off all of their AI learning stuff and all of their knowledge graph into PWAs because people like them and they're fast and they work offline. That's new. All right, app to app plugins. That's not really a thing. I made that up because there's not a name for this. But Google, on Android phones, is giving people apps that crawl the content in their other apps and include that content in their app. 
Google is sending out things to, like sending out apps that will aggregate the app content on your phone and represent it in their app. Google Home does this. Especially, it was much more obvious when it was called the Chromecast app. They would say, do you want to start watching Archer again and cast it? Yes, I do, right? They knew what I was watching in Netflix, and they brought it up there, OK? So they're crawling the other apps, and they're doing that with deep links. The same thing's happening in Android Auto. Android Auto can open whatever map that I've used Google Maps recently for. It knows what I was playing in Audible and what chapter I'm on exactly. It'll start exactly where I was. It knows where I've gone recently. It knows where I am. And I can toggle between all of those things and interact with, for instance, my Audible book or what I was playing on Google Music or what I was playing even in Amazon Music, and it'll play it with all the controls in the Android Auto app. Android Wear, this has always been kind of like plugins because there's just not a big enough utility to, to do that. But you're buying little plugins that work mainly off the, the memory on your phone, but send it through Bluetooth to the watch screen. Okay? It's like apps in apps or app to app situations. What's fascinating here, especially from an ASO scenario, is that in most of these cases, you can download apps directly from these utilities without having to be thrown to the Google Play Store. They're surfacing and letting you download new apps that work with this existing app here without the friction of opening up the Google Play app. Also, two weeks ago, uh, Google announced that soon you're going to be able to download apps directly from a Google search result, from a SERP page. So people won't have to go to the store there either. They're cutting down on the friction, at least for Android users. And that means that the ASO is that much more powerful, the app store optimization, the app packs, stuff like that. We're cutting out the websites, right? The apps that are in the Google Play Store, they kind of have a URL, but not really, right? They wouldn't need it anymore. This is happening to some degree in Apple as well um, with iMessage. It's their chat bot that can integrate. You can build iMessage integrations on your app and interact with the, low, the native apps on your phone with chatting to them. That's kind of cool. But then the really big new thing here that I think illustrates the point is Google Actions. So to understand Google Actions, you have to understand Google Assistant. When I was saying, how do you say car in French? It was with Google Assistant. Um, and Google Assistant lives in the Google Home, lives in a Pixel phone, um, but Google wants to put the Assistant everywhere. And this is the chatbot loop that I was talking about with AI um, narrowing down exactly what you want. And you can see it knows things. Um, you can ask it questions. It knows things. It gets that basically from the knowledge graph. But it knows lots of other things, too. Now, what do we see here? What do these things, three things have in common? Google gets them in feeds. This is the stuff that Google's getting in, a, in an updated, feedy kind of way, XML kind of way, and you can query it to know what's going on now because they don't want you to query the SERP because that, if it's not showing the feed at the top, the content might have had to be crawled and it might not be fresh enough. Google is also using this interaction to crowdsource and microsource what people want. So I say, what is the weather in Portland? It gives me the weather in Portland, makes a silly joke, like, don't forget a raincoat. And then it says, do you have other questions? Lots of people wanted to know what about the weekend or what about tomorrow? And so without doing another search, I can say, yes, I would like to know about tomorrow and click it again. It's trying to anticipate your next query based on your first query, just like it did with the Florence and the Machine and Knowledge Graph, right? But they're also taking AI or take, taking information from other places and feeding it to their AI. Who's seen these on a bounce result on their phone? It slides in other things. When you search for that but didn't find it on that web page, what did you really mean? Did you mean this query, this query, or this query? Because we have other information that seems like it might be what you want. Click here. And that information feeds back what did people mean when they searched for this? What did they really want? Why didn't you find it? How could we help you find it? Same thing, people also ask. That's helping them, that's feeding the AI. So here's an example. 
of a Google action. This is the open table action. It ranks in regular search results. You don't have to be in Google Assistant. It's pushing other search results down. It ranks in position zero. I search for make a reservation at Root Down. It's a place in Denver. It gives me the action with a logo, make a reservation, what day do you want it, what time, how many people. It knows the default settings. And it lets me use radio buttons to pick, continue. It'll even give me confirmation. And if I try and rebook it, like I think something went wrong, look at the far right. It says, no, you already got that. Do you want another reservation that same day? It's confused, right? It's giving me instant feedback in the app and in the web. You don't have to have the app for this to work. It's all happening in the cloud. You just have to have an account and be logged in. What's interesting is, or what's cool is, that action works on voice-only searches as well. Works with the assistant, works with Google Home. You have a visual and a verbal interface, and the bots do the work to present it wherever you're trying to access it. This is mobile-first indexing. This is portable-first indexing. It works wherever you need it. So it's actually not all that complicated to do this if you have content separate from design, separate from a presentation layer. It basically is creating an API, and that API interacts with other APIs, like a fulfillment service if you're ordering paper towels or something like that, and it interacts with the information Google already has in the cloud about you and your payment methods and your address, stuff like that. And so Google loves APIs, and there are a lot of other APIs out there, but APIs just basically allow my stuff to connect to your stuff, even though they were built by different developers, right, who didn't know each other and don't do things exactly the same way. So it joins things up that were separate. And Google uses APIs for lots of things that are mobile first, like app indexing. I don't know if you know, but app indexing can be public or private. Google is indexing things for public search in a regular search result, but also indexing your own app behavior on your phone. So is Apple. And now they've launched Google Cloud, so you can search for it and say, I know I did this thing. I don't remember which device it was on. Where do I find it? And it's all saved to your cloud. This is a clear indication that they're wanting everything off the device and on the cloud. This is another thing, where they're capturing things in the cloud on all my different devices. This is a story of my day, and this is like part of the Android OS on a Pixel. It says, I started off at home and I took two pictures of my dog. He's cute. Then I drove somewhere. Then I walked somewhere. Then I went to Ink Coffee. Then I went to TJ Maxx. Then I went to downtown Denver. Then I went home. Then I took more pictures of my dog. It's taken things from the map and the camera. It knows how fast I was going, what method of transportation I was using, so that it can personalize the information and feedback it gives me based on my habits and what I interact with and what I use. So where is this all going? Google wants the assistant on all the different devices. It wants to have AI and information about you and everything else indexable from the cloud so that it can be a, present a presentation layer anywhere, so that it can let you search and find what you need anywhere. And for that to work, it has to happen in the cloud. So what if cloud-first programming is the new SEO, or maybe feed-first programming, or something? Is that possible? What if URLs aren't the end-all, be-all of indexing? I think AI and big data is getting us there. It lets Google generate static content software apps like those Google Knowledge Graph PWAs on the fly, basically. It's like what Will was talking about yesterday, Will Reynolds. Google can go in and do this automatically with software and replace you if you're not doing it for them first or if you're not sending them the feed first. And it's going to rank in position zero at the top because they host it. So you've got to be more clever to be at the top of mobile-first indexing. Google is also enabling people to create their own chatbots. This is the interface on a Google Pixel, where with your Google Home, you can set up keywords to do something. And you can say, hey, Google, all that jazz. And it's going to play all that jazz. Or it's going to flash the lights, right? Dance party. 
whatever. You can create your own keywords to pr and program them to do whatever you want with your connected devices. So there's an auto response. Um, there are also the ability to, uh, if you're using Google Post out of Google Plus for Business, they've just added the ability to create autoresponders in messaging so that small businesses can say, when someone asks any query that includes the word hours, we respond with the hours for today. When someone asks this question, we respond with this. What's that sound like? It's the beginning of, it's a simple chatbot. You're saying query answer, right? They're letting small businesses create chatbots there too. Now just remember, Chrome is a browser, but it's beginning to work like a remote OS. You can run Android apps on Mac and PC, on Google Chrome. Uh, Android is now bigger than Windows. Google's taking over. Google wants AI. Google doesn't care about URLs anymore. This is mobile first indexing. You can get the presentation here. These are the stars of the presentation. That's their names. <laughs> 